I thank you for this day. I thank you that you are ministering to us, that you are faithful, that you are the very air we breathe. I thank you that apart from you, we can do nothing. Lord, I pray that as we look at the scriptures today, you would touch our hearts. You would change us. You would make us more into your image than we were when we got here. I thank you that you are faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever gone and looked at a piece of modern art? I really dislike modern art. It's, I, I've, I've had this fight with a couple of my friends where I'm like, you know what, if you need a playbook, it doesn't count as art. If somebody has to explain to you why it's art, it shouldn't count. There's so many different ways to look at it and interpret it, you know, and you have all these people who come up with these great interpretations, you know, it's a used Kleenex sitting there in the center and they're like, well, this describes the difficulties of capitalism. And you're going, no, it's a used Kleenex. There was actually a really funny case in New York in one of these galleries where this modern artist was trying to be all edgy. So his piece of art was a piece of glass leaning against the wall. And he had a little plaque, you know, and it was supposed to be some deep, significant thing about the eternal values of the world or something. But there was a janitor at this uh, art gallery, and the janitor came along and looked and said, there's a piece of glass leaning against the wall. That's a hazard. And he picked up this valuable piece of art, and he carted it out to the back and got rid of it because it was a danger to the public. Interpretations can lead you to very different things sometimes in the world, can't they? There's things that happen in this world that are confusing to some, and you can look at them many different ways. Have you ever played that game Telephone? Did you play that when you were a kid? Where you whisper in their, their ear and you'll say something, and then the next person has to repeat it, and by the time you've gone around the room, it's a really strange thing that comes out. It's actually a new version of it on the internet that I play with the, the youth group where you have to draw pictures and then describe the pictures and draw them and describe them and it gets really hilarious sometimes. But interpretation can be an odd thing to try and figure out and in fact sometimes people say the same thing about scriptures. Have you ever heard that? There's many ways to interpret scripture so nobody can really be sure. Have you heard that? I mean, how do you know what's the right interpretation? So many people interpret it so many ways, there just can be no certainty as to what the Bible says. Maybe it says it for you, but for me it says something completely different. Well, thankfully we don't have to just go off of what people say, so we turn to the book of 2 Peter and we see if Peter thinks this is true. Now remember, Peter, the great apostle, the rock that Christ was going to build the church on, he had some entertaining times in his journey with Christ. He lived and walked and saw Christ. And today he begins by saying, we did not follow cleverly dis devised myths. This is in chapter 1, verse 16. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter reminds the people as he's giving this letter that this isn't myths. This isn't stories. This isn't things that somebody cooked up about something that happened 600 or 800 or 1,000 years ago that maybe did or didn't happen. He's reminding them this isn't just some clever thing that someone came up with. And all the other gods of that day were actually myths. Peter's reminding them that there's something different about Christ. Everyone else, you know, the, the gods of Olympus, were they had all these stories about what they did in ages past. And in fact, Plato, one of the great philosophers of the Greeks, had said, you know, if you want to keep control of people, here's what you do. You come up with a good myth. You come up with a good story and you teach all the children this story about how if they do like the gods, they'll be good, but if they don't, then they'll get in trouble. The myth was an idea that kept people in line, that gave people power over people. But Peter was coming and he was saying, I'm not bringing you a myth that will give me 
power over you. I'm coming to declare the truth of Jesus Christ. I'm coming to tell you what I saw with my own eyes. Jesus Christ standing on the Mount of Transfiguration. One minute, he was this carpenter from Judea. Someone who wasn't very important. Someone who was, as the scriptures say, un, uh, unnoticeable. He was just a regular guy. Nothing about him would attract attention. And the next moment, he was transfigured. And they saw him as he truly was in all of his glory. And they saw Moses and Elijah talking to him. And it so blew Peter's mind. Peter didn't know what to do. Peter had a problem with his jaw. You know, it just started working when he didn't want it to. And he's saying, Lord, this is great. This is awesome. Let's build some booths. I'll build a booth for you. I'll build a booth for Elijah. We'll just hang out here forever. He talked a little too much. And all of a sudden, as he was getting all excited, a voice came from heaven and said, This is my son. Listen to him. Okay, I guess I'll listen. And we know how the story went for Peter. The voice from heaven came. They saw Jesus transfigured. They heard God say, Pay attention to him. This is not a myth. This is not something that Peter heard from a friend of a friend of a friend. You ever hear that on the internet where people will come up and they'll be like, oh yeah, my friend's uncle's cousin's third cousin's cat told me that this was going to happen. Oh wow, wow. And it becomes this big thing on the internet. You know, you get all these myths. I, I had a fellow come to me one time and he said, chemtrails. Have you heard of the chemtrails? I heard from a guy who heard from a guy who worked for the CIA. Well, you know what the chemtrails are? Every time you see a white cloud in the sky coming off a plane, it's because they're sprinkling chemicals on you really. And I didn't quite believe him. But you have this happen where people talk about things as though they happen, but they have no evidence. And Peter is saying, this isn't what we're talking about. We're not talking about something we heard third or fourth or fifth person. We're talking about something we saw with our own eyes. We know Jesus exists. We know he's real. More than that, we know he's not just a man. He's the Son of God. We witnessed His transfiguration. We witnessed His crucifixion and death. We all ran. And we witnessed His resurrection. We met the resurrected Lord. Thomas actually put his hand in his side, saw the nail marks, and fell down and said, My Lord and God, we were there when all these things happened. This is sure. Unlike myths and stories, the gospel is well attested and well witnessed and this is just from a historical point of view you know there's some people who say oh well you know i don't really believe jesus exists even scholars who aren't christians know that jesus existed did you know there is more historical evidence for the existence of a man jesus christ than there is for julius caesar we have more actual eyewitness accounts of a man named jesus who lived in the, the, uh, the Middle East in Judea than we have for the Emperor Julius Caesar. Just so you know, we have more attestation for the reliability of the New Testament than we have for most other ancient books. I just had to bring this out because I love, I love reading these. Normally I don't get into statistics and stuff, but this is fun. There are over 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. There are over 8,000 in Latin and 1,000 in other languages that are older than other manuscripts. There are also thousands of citations in the early church fathers. Did you know if we had not a single copy of the New Testament, just from the quotes in the early church fathers, you could put the whole New Testament together? So people come to, sometimes come and they say, well, it's changed so much. How do you know what's true? How do you know that it's even the one that you've got? It's regularly, uh, completely attested by multiple manuscripts, by multiple evidence from multiple directions over many years. Did you know the oldest bit of a gospel is the Gospel of Luke? It's from the first century A.D. It's from just a few years after Christ, like the actual piece of parchment that they have. They actually found it in Egypt in a dump. Gotta love dumps. This is why I throw your stuff away. Don't burn it because otherwise archaeologists will have no fun later on. There's better attestation of the manuscripts of the New Testament than any other documents that we have from ancient time. Homer... Does everyone know Homer, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey? There are less than 2,000 manuscripts of Homer. 
And the, the closest manuscript that we have is about a thousand years from when it was actually written. Plato, you remember Plato, the great philosopher that everyone quotes? There are only seven extant manuscripts of Plato, of which the closest to Plato is a thousand years from when he lived and wrote. Aristotle, only 49. Caesar, only 10. Caesar wrote a great book, I love to read it, about his fighting with the Gauls in, in uh, France. And we only have 10 copies. We have very little evidence that the book actually existed besides those few copies. Tacitus, a great historian that everyone quotes faithfully, only 20. And yet, for the New Testament, we have thousands and thousands of thousands. And unlike all those other ones where there can be up to a thousand years of distance between when they were written, the New Testament is right there. We can find these documents immediately. We can find the quotes, the attestations immediately. So just, I, I, I don't usually throw statistics, but I want you to get this. The Bible is very well attested. It is very firm from a clear, factual point of view. But more importantly, when you look in the Bible, what does it say? Jesus appeared not to one person while they were, you know, high on some mushrooms out in the corner. Or maybe they were out doing some ayahuasca with some, some people on the far side of the Indian village there. They, this isn't something that just happened in someone's dreams. You know, someone once said, well, maybe he was just alive in the hearts of his disciples. The scriptures tell us that at one point he appeared to 500 people at one time. Now that's a pretty good case of mass hysteria if they all saw someone who didn't exist. He appeared to many and he appeared finally to Paul as one who who was uh, late born. He showed himself to have been alive. He proved himself and he proved his message. What was what he said? I am the I am. If you want proof that I am, here's what's going to happen. I am going to die and then I'm going to rise again. And what happened? He died. And then what happened? He rose from the dead. He proved that his words were true, that everything he said actually happened. And Peter saw the whole thing. I mean, it would be indelibly etched on his mind because he was the one who said, I don't know him. And then had Jesus look right at him. Can you imagine? Oh, that would be written on your heart for the rest of your life. So Peter had the solid proof, he attested that Jesus had spoken, that he had seen him, that he had lived with him. But more importantly, he goes on and he says, we have a prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. As if this is not enough, we have the prophetic word. Peter wasn't just starting with the New Testament, but he had the entire Old Testament, the prophetic words that had been handed down, faithfully transmitted. You know, the, the Hebrew text of the, of the Old Testament is so carefully copied that they actually count every letter. The guys who hand copied those scrolls of all of the Old Testament would write each letter, and if they made a single mistake, they had to burn the scroll and start again. So you can actually go to the old scrolls that they found of, of the Old Testament, and you can count the letters, and it'll be the same letter at exactly the middle every time. And it'll be the same word at the middle every time. They had ways of checking to ensure that it was perfect. So they are so carefully transmitted that you can take a, a modern Old Testament in Hebrew and you can take one that they found with the Dead Sea Scrolls that came from the time of Christ and you can match them together perfectly. They are almost error free and any error that they have is like a, a matter of a little bit of a, a punctuation thing. There is no uh, error that would in any way change the message of the Old Testament. So they have this consistent prophetic word that was handed down. They had the word of God that said, if you obey me, you will live. They had the law that pointed forward to Christ. They had all the prophets who came and said, listen to God. I desire obedience rather than sacrifice. They had this testimony of a Messiah who would come. They had a sure knowledge of Jesus, and then they added to it 
these letters, these precious words, the testimony of four different disciples of the life of Christ. Have you ever wondered why there's four, by the way? Have you ever noticed that they're slightly different? It's because you get to see Christ from different angles. Matthew was a Jew, and he actually wrote his gospel to emphasize to the Jews that this man was the man who fulfilled Scripture. Luke was a Gentile. Did you know that? The only Gentile writer in the New Testament. And he wrote to show that Jesus was a friend of the poor and the downtrodden and the Gentile. He emphasized the fact that Jesus cared for those that others didn't care about. He wrote a factual history, he says, that correctly uh, defined it. John wrote, so that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah. Each wrote from a different angle and emphasized different things, but between them all, you get this full 3D picture of Christ. You then get all these letters written by Paul, written by Peter, written by all these other people who fill in details of doctrine, of faith, of truth, so that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt of what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to live, what you're supposed to believe. And what does Peter say here? If you look upon these prophecies as to a lamp shining in a dark place, then the morning star will rise in your heart. As you focus on the scripture, as you look at the truth that you find in the revealed word of God, you don't become more confused. You don't become more doubtful. You don't become more questioning. But you see God revealed to you. You see his own living words. You see the power of the gospel for your life. It's both on the basic level. Hey, guess what? If you do good to those who hurt you, something unique is going to happen. And it's also on a deeper level. The righteous shall live by faith. This book tells you how to be human. How to live the way you were meant to live. How to be free from the pain, the burden, the anxiety, the doubt, the fear, the, the struggles that come with sin. Because it says there is a way to be free from sin in Jesus Christ. By the power of the Spirit. And this book shows you who to put your faith in. We were studying in the, in the uh, Sunday school there about that fact that some people were trying to add to the gospel. They were saying you have to do other things. And Peter came along and he testified to them, I saw the Gentiles saved by faith, that God had changed their hearts, had cleansed them, not because of what they did, but because of who they believe. This is the testimony of the scriptures. It's an idea that is so simple, a child can grasp it fully. And yet it's so complex, you can spend your whole life looking into these living words and seeing more and deeper truths for yourself. You can see more things that need to be changed and opened up and shifted in your life. There is no end of what you can get out of the Bible. It's one of the things I love the most about the scriptures. I actually got to be Peter. Did I tell you about that? I had a class where we were doing a, a New Testament theology class. And the way we did it was we broke it up according to the authors of the New Testament. And I got to only read the Peter books. And I got to write what Peter thought on different things according to what I saw in the scriptures. And it was really interesting because, of course, one of the things that people say is, well, you know, Paul thought this and Peter thought this and they kind of had fights about different things and there's contradictions. You know what we found? No matter what the issue was, when we all gathered together in our conference of apostles in my class and when we presented our point of view, they agreed. Why? Because it wasn't just people writing these books. It was God and the Holy Spirit writing these books, and it leaves you with a lamp in the darkness and a solid rock when everything else is shifting. I got a little bit distracted last night, Brian and I. I was looking for an illustration on this point, and I was watching earthquake videos. Have you ever watched video of an earthquake? It is nuts. Because you stand here and you think, the ground is pretty firm, right? But when an earthquake gets going, the whole world starts moving and the cars are shaking and big buildings. We were watching one where there was a huge skyscraper building and it was rocking back and forth like this. Just, you could see it rocking. And the guy who was filming was in another one and I thought, oh man, 
You must just be totally terrified to be standing on top of a tall building as the world around you shakes. But an earthquake makes even the most solid, firm thing, the ground, uncertain, unsteady, shakable. And this is how our life can be sometimes. We get in positions in life where even the things that we thought were firm fall down. You know, maybe somebody's sure about their family. Everybody else will never betray me, you know, or might betray me, but my family never will. Maybe it's, you know, your hockey team. Who knows what it is that you base your life on? I mean, clearly the Oilers are, of course, the best, and you can always trust them not to fail. But we build our lives on things. I had one person who came to me, and I, I, was, I was talking to him, and I said, what do you believe in? And he said, I believe in myself. I said, well, that's kind of stupid. And we talked about it because he said, you know, I'm struggling with anxiety. I'm struggling with fear. I have all these doubts, all these uncertainties. And I said, remember when you said you believe in yourself? Yourself is not firm. Yourself is not sure. Nothing in this world is sure. Excuse me, sure. But the scriptures are. The word of God never changes. Nothing can shift who God is how he relates to us, what he does. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he will always be that firm foundation that we can build our lives upon. When the earthquakes happen, we stand there in the middle of it, unaffected, because it doesn't matter what happens in life around us. He gives us assurance, confidence. He takes away the fear. The scriptures say, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, make your request known for God, to God. Why can we be uh, not worrying about anxiety? Because we know who knows. We know who is trustworthy. Does it mean we won't have moments of anxiety? Let me tell you, we will. But we can be sure that he is faithful. We can look upon him and find something solid. And the cool thing about looking at the scriptures, like it says here, a lamp shining in the dark is the day dawns in our hearts. And we now are not just knowing the word because we read it, but we're confirming the word because it's alive in us, because he is living in us. That's the amazing thing about being a believer. Someone said to me once, you know, well, how can you be sure that the Bible is real? I said, for me, it's a statement of faith. I can give you all those statistics that I gave, but you know why I believe in the scriptures? You know why I believe they're true? Because I have seen the proof in my life. A man who could not stop being angry, all of a sudden was able to. How? Because God did a work in me like he promised to do in his word. In all these areas where I struggle or I doubt or I fear, I can go to him, I can read his promises, and I can prove they're true in my life. I can testify that he is indeed faithful. But you'll ask, aren't there multiple interpretations of the scriptures? I mean, surely, you know, you can read this thing 16 different ways. I actually played this game with, with my uh, students one time in hermeneutics. I said, you know, you can, you can find some really interesting interpretations of the Bible. I said, let's take David. He cut off the head of Goliath, right? So clearly what we're supposed to do is when we encounter evil people, we're supposed to knock them over with a rock, we're supposed to take out a sword, and we're supposed to cut off their head and then carry it around with us. The Bible gives us that example, right? That's an example of bad hermeneutics. We can look at the Bible and indeed we can find various interpretations, but it doesn't take long to see the problems with the interpretations that aren't very healthy, right? Hey, do you think the Bible is telling you that you should cut people's heads off? Well, no, there's lots of spots where it says don't commit murder. Oh, rats. We can be confident, but we can't just be confident because of our understanding. He says, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But man spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. How can we be confident about the scriptures? Because the scriptures aren't a human book. They didn't come from people trying to write clever things. Have you ever had the opportunity to read the Book of Mormon or, or the Quran? I've had to read both, unfortunately, the Quran more than once. It's not a fun book to read. They're different because they're human books. One of my favorite books 
is actually a series, Winston Churchill's History of the Second World War. You want to read a good book. It's intense. It's alive. It's got so much uh, personal level to it because he was at the height of government and he knew things. But guess what? It's not scripture. It doesn't have the same life of the Bible. Why? It's a human book. It's a history written by a dude. But the Word of God is different because it comes from Christ. It was not randomly chosen by people. That's another claim that people make about the Bible. Well, you know, they just picked which books would be in, and there's these other Gospels that are, you know, just as good, but the church didn't like them because they didn't give them enough power. That's not how it went. People say, well, at the Council of Nicaea, they decided what books were Christian or were, were the Bible or not. No, they confirmed at that council in 325, the books that had been attested by their power, by what they had said, that they were, in fact, the Word of God. And it was an interesting standard that they used. One holy apostolic Catholic. In other words, it had to be consistent with the gospel message. It had to show by its content that it was holy, that it was preaching truth, not preaching crazy sinful ideas. It had to be apostolic, meaning it had to come from one of the apostles. You couldn't just have any old person write a book and say, oh, that's clearly scripture. It had to come from one of the people who had known Jesus Christ. And finally, Catholic, universal. It had to be broadly used by those who were Christian people and who had the Holy Spirit living within them. And indeed, what did they find? It was pretty easy to figure out. Have you heard of the Gospel of Thomas? Made a big splash a few years back. A new gospel has been discovered. <gasps> well, it's what's called a Gnostic gospel. It was this group of people that were really big into their own view of, of salvation. And they said, basically, the body doesn't matter. The body is matter and flesh, and therefore it doesn't count. Only spirit counts. So whatever you do with the body is cool. You can live like the devil because your spirit is the part that's pure. Because there's two gods. There was the good God and the bad God, and they're in an eternal war, and they were fighting each other, and they created the world, and on and on and on it goes. And this is the Gospel of Thomas. Surprisingly, the church never took up the Gospel of Thomas, but they said, hold on, that's not consistent with the message of the Gospel. That's not consistent with Christ. That's not consistent with the Old Testament God. So it's not true, and the church didn't buy it. Many people have tried to create fabrications, and it goes on even to today. There's people who try to change the Bible today or who say, I hear specially from the Lord, and I have my own revelation. Yes, I know the Bible says this, but good news, it's not true anymore. Let me tell you what's actually true. And they're crazy. That's what it is. They're nuts. There's people like Joseph Smith. You've heard about him. He had this amazing moment where an angel came to him. And the angel said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a hat on your face and then roll these magical golden dice. And from that, you're going to get interpretations and you're going to write a new book called the Book of Mormon. It's nuts. And then there's Muhammad who went out into the desert and all of a sudden had visions of an angel. I'm having visions. And he came home and his wife said, ooh, you should write those down. And if you've ever read the Quran, that's about how it sounds. He didn't actually see God, but he wanted new revelation. You know what's one of the interesting things about people who get new revelation? It always seems to allow them to do whatever sinful thing they wanted to do to start with. And when we get our new revelations, when we get a moment where we're like, I think I'm hearing from God, and he's saying exactly what I want him to say, we should question it. We should doubt it. Why? Because this is where we get the word of God. This is where we know what's true or what's not. And the challenging thing is sometimes the Bible is going to disagree with us. The Bible is going to say, you got to change. The Bible is going to say, what you're doing is wrong. And we have two options at that moment. We can decide that we can be like God, knowing good from evil. And we can follow the same path that humans have always followed. Or we can say, God, it knows what's good for me and I must submit to him. In my theology class, I give this illustration. We can either look down in judgment upon the scriptures, or we can hold it over our heads and obey it. There's two ways to approach the Bible, and it's always been that way, even back as far as Peter, who had to remind people about the truth of the scriptures. No prophecy was ever spoken by the will of man, 
but the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. Sixty-six books attested and confirmed, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide even bones from marrow, soul from spirit. This is not just a human book, and it should not be treated as a human book. The Bible that we hold is not loose. It's not flowery. It's not the words of mere men, and it's not there just to make us feel good or, or medicate us until we die. It is there to show us God, and in showing us God to provide us salvation, freedom from sin. And it will never change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Christ was seen, his word received, so we can confidently believe. God has spoken to us. Isn't that amazing? The God of the universe took the time to say, I'm going to show myself to you. He revealed himself in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus walked with his disciples, talked with people, healed, ministered to people, bled and died for people. And Jesus Christ rose again to prove that what he said was true. There's no question of this, but there's a great assurance. God gave us the Bible, and it's not a, a dark mystery, a questionable or a doubtful thing that we can't know or we can't be certain of, that we have to seek and hope and pray that somehow we could possibly be right. The Bible is sure, and we can know what God wants us to know for our lives, for our faith, for our walk with Him today. We can be assured, even as a child, that we know the truth and that the truth will set us free. And this Bible yet can be complex enough that we can spend this lifetime of ours digging in and knowing God more every day. We don't follow cleverly devised myths. We don't follow the words of men. We don't need some secret method so that we can somehow find the silver bullet that someday maybe will provide us with a way through where everyone else isn't going to make it. We can have confidence that we can open this book of the Word of God. We can find clear, clean, refreshing truth of a God who gave Himself so that we could be saved from our sins. This book gives us a standard to live by and to follow in our every day and our every action. It gives us hope and assurance that we can know what we're called to do, that we can truly live the way he meant us to live. We can have confidence in him. So here's where I get to meddling. CCF, you guys, me. Are we confident today in the truth of the Word of God? Do you believe it? And if you believe it, do you live it? Do you believe that this is the living, breathing Word of God, the truth of Jesus Christ? And if so, are you submitting to it in your life today? Are you willing to recognize that you have to follow the whole thing as the scriptures say, you can follow the whole law, but if you're short on just one point, it doesn't matter. You must believe in Jesus Christ. It's not enough to be good. It's not enough to try hard. It's not enough to make your own way or to set your own rules. You have to listen to the one who built you. You have to hear his words today for you. Now, as we talk, guys... <laughs> This is one of those times when the Holy Spirit will be speaking to you. So listen. He's going to be saying to you, here's something that you're not listening to. Hey, Pastor Matthew's talking. Listen. Because guess what? He does the same thing for me every time I go and read the scriptures. Hey, Matthew, here's something you're not doing. You ought to think about that. You ought to change. And when we listen to the Spirit, we will grow. We will change. We will find that we are indeed walking the way we're supposed to. But if we resist Him, if we say no, then we can say all I want. I believe in Jesus. But we make our lives a lie. We show by our lives that we aren't speaking 
the truth? Do you believe the Word of God? And if so, today is the day to do it. And that's for all of us. Don't worry, I'm not talking down to you because I need it just as much as anyone. Are you proving by your actions that this book is not merely a prop that you carry under your arm to look good? Can we say with Peter that we will pay attention to the word like a lamp shining in the dark as the morning star rises in our hearts? I hope today that this is true for us. I hope that we're seriously dwelling on our lives to say, God, are you at work in me? God, where do you need to change me? God, do I believe in you today? And if so, praise God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I do pray that you would reach into our hearts. Lord, if there are some among us that don't know you yet, that have yet to surrender, I pray right now that you would speak clearly, that you would cut through any other consideration, any stop, any hindrance, that you would show yourself to us. Lord, if there are those of us who are in rebellion, who are resistant, who are not listening to you, I pray that you would break us down. Do what it takes that we may be humble, that we may follow you. Lord, may we trust you. Give us the power and the strength by your spirit to do what you've called us to do. May we be alive. May the morning star rise in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.